In this video, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to intermediate code and its use in compilers. So the first question to address is what is intermediate code or an intermediate language? And as the name suggests, an intermediate language is just that. It's a language that's intermediate between the source language and the target language. So keep in mind what a compiler does. So a compiler takes a program written in some source language and it provides a translation of that program into some target language. And so in this class, for example, where often our source language is cool and our target language is MIPS assembly code. Now, an intermediate language actually lives uh, in between these two, and a compiler that uses an intermediate language will first translate its source language into the intermediate language, and then later translate the intermediate, uh, the code in the intermediate language uh, into the target language. And you might wonder, well, why uh, make life so difficult? Why, when, you know, why, why do something in two steps uh, if you can do it in one step? And it turns out that for many purposes, this intermediate uh, level here is actually quite useful precisely because it provides an intermediate level of abstraction. So uh, in particular, the uh, intermediate language might have more details in it than the source language. Uh, so for example, if we uh, want to optimize register usage, um, you know, a source language like Cool has no notion of registers at the source level, and so there's no way to even express the kinds of optimizations you might want to do with registers. So an intermediate language that exposes that, that amount of detail, at least has registers in it, uh, would allow you to uh, talk about and, and write algorithms that could try to improve the use of registers in the program. On the other hand, uh, the intermediate language will also have fewer details uh, than the target. And so it might be, for example, that the intermediate language is a little bit above the level of the particular instruction set of a particular machine, and therefore it's easier to retarget that, uh, that intermediate level of code to lots of different kinds of machines, precisely because it doesn't have um, all the grubby details in it of a particular machine. And it, experience has shown that this is actually a pretty good idea to have intermediate language, and almost all compilers have an intermediate language, uh, in fact, in their implementation, and some compilers have more than one. Some compilers actually translate uh, through an entire series of intermediate languages between the source and the target language. Now, we're only going to consider one intermediate language uh, for the rest of this course. The kind of intermediate language we're going to look at is going to be a high-level assembly. And so, as I suggested on the previous slide, this language is going to use register names, uh, but it will have an unlimited number, so we can use any number of registers that we like. We're not bound to 32 or 64 uh, registers. Uh, the control structures will look a lot like assembly language. In particular, there will be explicit jumps and labels on instructions. And the language will also have opcodes in it, so it look like assembly language level opcodes, but some of these opcodes will be higher level. So for example, we might have an opcode called push, and a push would end up translating into several uh, concrete assembly language instructions for a particular target machine. In the intermediate code that we'll be looking at, every instruction will have one of two forms. It will either be a binary operation, or it will be a unary operation. And always, uh, the arguments on the right-hand side, in this case the Y and the Z, uh, will be either registers or constants. They could also be uh, immediate values. Um, and this is a very, very common form of intermediate code. It's so widely used. It's so widely used, it actually has a name. It's called three address code um, because every instruction has at most three addresses in it. Uh, two arguments, at most two arguments, and then uh, a destination. Now, to see that this uh, code is actually low level, um, notice that you know, higher level expressions that involve multiple operations will have to be translated into a sequence of instructions that do only one operation at a time. So for example, if I have the expression x equals, uh, sorry, x plus y times z, and let me put in parens here to show the association, so the times binds more tightly than the plus, we're going to have to, this can't be written directly in an intermediate uh, language of this form. Instead, we would have to write it something like the following. We'd have to first compute y times z, and 
We're now ready to begin our next major topic, program optimization. In this video, we're just going to give an overview discussing why we want to perform optimization and what the trade-offs are uh, for compilers in deciding what kinds of optimizations to implement. Optimization is the last compiler phase that we're going to discuss. Uh, let's just very briefly review uh, the compiler phases. First, there's lexical analysis, and then that's followed by parsing. And then we have semantic analysis. And th after that, uh, we talked about code generation. And now we're going to talk about optimization. Okay, so optimization actually comes before code generation because we want to improve the program before we commit it to machine code. Uh, but it is, of course, the last one that we've discussed. But uh, just you know, to point out here, optimization fits in between generally semantic analysis and code generation. And in modern compilers, uh, this is where most of the action is. It's, it usually has by far the most code, and it's also the most complex part of the compiler. Now, a very basic question is when we should perform optimizations, and we actually have some choices. Uh, we could perform them on the abstract syntax tree, and a big advantage of that is that it's machine independent, um, but for many optimizations we want to do, uh, this, it turns out that the abstract syntax tree will be too high level, that we can't actually even express the optimizations we want to perform because those optimizations depend on uh, lower level details of the machine uh, or of the, the kind of machine that we're generating code for that aren't present in the abstract syntax tree. Another possibility would be to perform optimizations directly on assembly language. And the advantage here is that all the details of the machine are exposed. We can see everything that the machine is doing. Uh, we can talk about all of the resources of the machine. And so in principle, any optimization we want to perform can be expressed at the assembly language level. Now, a disadvantage of doing optimizations on assembly language is that they are machine dependent. And then we would have to potentially re-implement our optimizations for each new kind of architecture. And so, uh, as we mentioned in the previous video, uh, another option uh, is to use an intermediate language. And the intermediate language has the advantage, uh, potentially, if it's designed well, of still being machine independent, meaning it can, it can be a little bit above the level of the concrete details of very, very specific uh, architectures. Um, and it can still uh, represent a large family of machines. Um, but while, at the same time, exposing enough optimization opportunities that uh, the compiler can do a good job of improving the program's performance. So we will be looking at optimizations that work on an intermediate language um, that uh, has operations given by this grammar. So a, in this case, a program is a sequence of statements, and a statement uh, consists of either uh, an assignment, uh, which could be a simple copy, or a unary or binary operation, uh, we can push and pop things from a stack, and then we have a couple of different kinds of jumps. Uh, we have a comparison and jump, where we compare the values of two registers and then conditionally jump to a label. Uh, we have unconditional jumps, and finally there are labels, the targets of jumps. And the identifiers here are the register names, and we could also use immediate values uh, on the right-hand side of operations uh, instead of uh, registers. And the typical operators, we, we're just going to assume some typical family of operators like plus, minus, times, etc. Now, optimizations typically work on groups of statements. And one of the most important and useful statement groupings is the basic block. So a basic block is a sequence of instructions. And typically, we want it to be the longest possible sequence of instructions. So we want it to be maximal. Uh, and this sequence has two properties. First of all, there are no labels. Uh, except possibly for the very first instruction. And there are no jumps anywhere in this sequence of instructions except uh, possibly for the last instruction. And a basic block, um, the idea behind a basic block and, and the reason we require these two properties is that it's guaranteed uh, to flow, uh, execution is guaranteed to proceed from the first statement in the block to the last statement in the block. So the flow of control within a basic block is completely predictable. Uh, once we enter the block, once we begin at the first statement of the block, which might have a label, there will be a sequence of statements that must all execute uh, before. 
Now we're ready to begin talking about actual program optimizations, and we'll begin with local optimizations. Local optimization is the simplest form of program optimization because it focuses on optimizing just a single basic block, so just one basic block. And in particular, there's no need to worry about complicated control flow. We're not going to be looking at the entire method or procedure body. Let's dive right in and take a look at a couple of simple local optimizations. If x is an integer valued variable, and from here on we'll assume that x has type int, so let me just write that down. We're going to assume that x has type int in all of our examples on this slide. Uh, then the statement x equals x plus zero, well, that doesn't change the value of x. Zero is the additive identity for plus. Uh, we're just going to assign x the value it currently has, and so this statement is actually useless. It can just be deleted from the program. Similarly, for x equals x times 1, multiplying by 1 will not change the value of x, and so that statement can also be removed. And in this case, uh, these are great optimizations because we actually save an entire instruction. Now, some statements can't be deleted, but they can be simplified. Uh, a simple example of that is if we have x equals x times 0, so that can be replaced by the assignment x equals 0. And again, we, have, uh, we still have a statement here. We still have to execute a statement, but this statement may uh, execute more quickly because it doesn't involve actually running the, um, uh, the, the times operator. It doesn't involve uh, referencing uh, the value of x. Um, presumably x is a register. That doesn't really cost anything. But, you know, it's possible that this instruction over here will execute faster than this instruction over here. Now, on many machines, that's not the case. In fact, this assignment, of, uh, to this assignment on the right will take the same amount of time as the multiplication on the left. But as we will see, um, having an assignment of a constant to a variable will actually enable other optimizations. So this is still a very worthwhile transformation to do. Um, an example that's almost certainly an optimization is replacing uh, the exponentiation operator, um, raising a value to the power of 2 by an explicit multiply. So here we're computing y squared, and over here we just replace that by y times y. Uh, why is this a good idea? Well, this exponentiation operator here is almost certainly not a built-in machine instruction. Probably that's going to wind up in our generated code being a call to some built-in math library, and that will involve a function call overhead, and then there'll be some kind of general loop in there uh, to do the right number of multiplies. Uh, depending on what the exponent is. So in the special case where we know that the exponent is 2, it's much, much more efficient to just replace that call to exponentiation by an explicit multiply. Another example of uh, substituting one kind of operation for another in a, in a special situation is if we have a multiplication by a power of 2, we can replace that by a left bit shift. So here we're multiplying by 8. That's the same as shifting the uh, binary representation of x over by 3 bits, and, uh, and that will, you know, in fact, uh, compute the same thing. And it doesn't even have to be a power of 2. Um, if we have a multiplication by some other number that's not a power of 2, that can be replaced by some combination of shifting and, and subtractions. Okay, so we can replace the multiply by some combination of shifts and, uh, and arithmetic operations, simpler arithmetic operations. Now, these last two here, I should point out, you know, these are interesting transformations. On modern machines, uh, generally, this will not result in any kind of speed up because on modern machines, the integer multiply operation is just as fast as any other single instruction. On historical machines, these were actually significant optimizations. So all of these uh, instructions together are examples of algebraic simplifications. So uh, that just means exploiting properties of the mathematical operators to uh, uh, replace more complex uh, instructions or more complex operations by simpler ones. One of the most important and useful local optimizations is to compute the results of operations at compile time rather than at runtime if the arguments are known at compile time. So for example, let's say we have a three address instruction, x equals y op z, and it happens that y and z are both constants. These are both immediate values. These are, you know, literals in the instruction. Then we can actually compute the result of the right-hand side at compile time and replace this by an assignment to a constant. So, for example, if we have 
In this short video, I'm going to say a few words about a variation on local optimization that applies directly to assembly code called peephole optimization. The basic idea here is that instead of optimizing on intermediate code, we could do our optimizations directly on assembly code. And peephole optimization is one such technique. Um, the peephole is, stands for a short sequence of usually contiguous instructions. So the idea is that we have our program, we can, we can think of it as a long sequence of instructions, and our peephole is some window onto this program. So if we have a peephole of size 4, we can think of ourselves as staring through a small hole at the program, and all we can see is a short sequence of four instructions, and we can optimize that sequence. And then we can slide the peephole around to optimize different parts of the program. And they, what, the, what the optimizer will do is it will, you know, stare at this uh, short sequence of instructions, and if it knows a better sequence, uh, it will replace that sequence by uh, the other one, and then it will repeat this, as I said, you know, applying uh, other transformations to, to possibly the same or other parts of the assembly program. So people optimizations are generally written as replacement rules. So the, uh, we'll have the window of instructions on the left, so it'll be some sequence of instructions, and we'll know some other sequence of instructions that we would prefer on the right. So if we see this instruction sequence on the left, then we'll replace it by the one on the right-hand side. So for example, if I have a move from register B to register A, and then a move back uh, from register A to register B, well, that's uh, the second move is useless, can, can just be deleted, and so we can replace this two instruction sequence by a one instruction sequence. And this will work uh, provided that there's no possible jump target here. So if, if there's no possibility that the code would ever jump to this instruction, uh, then that instruction can be removed. Another example, if I add i to the register a, and then I subsequently add j to the register a, I can do a constant folding optimization here and combine those two, add, uh, two additions into one addition where I add the sum of i plus j to the register a. So many, but not quite all, of the basic block optimizations that we've discussed uh, in the last video can be cast also as peephole optimizations. So for example, um, if we are adding zero uh, to a register and then storing it in another register, well that can be replaced by a register move. Um, if we're moving a value from the same register to itself, uh, so this is like a self-assignment, well that instruction can just be deleted, replaced by the empty sequence of instructions. And together, for uh, those two instructions would be, uh, those two optimizations, excuse me, would be able to eliminate adding zero to a register. So first, this would get translated uh, into a move uh, from A to A, and then the move from A to A would get deleted. And as this little example illustrates, just like with local optimizations, people optimizations have to be applied repeatedly to get the maximum effect. I hope this simple discussion has illustrated for you that many optimizations can be applied directly uh, to assembly code, and that there's really nothing magic about optimizing intermediate code. So if you have a program written in any language, source language, intermediate language, assembly language, it makes sense to talk about doing transformations of programs written in that language uh, to improve the behavior of the program. And it's also a good time here to mention that program optimization is really a terrible term. Uh, the compilers do not produce optimal code, and it's purely an accident if a compiler were to somehow generate the best possible code for a given program. Really what compilers do is they have a bunch of transformations that they know will improve the behavior of the program, and they'll just improve it as much as they can. So really what program optimization is all about is program improvement. We're trying to make the program better, but there's no guarantee that we will uh, reach the best possible code for a given program.